Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Kerry McCarthy. Yeah. Yeah. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Crazy. Crazy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr. Mr Speaker, this week has seen the start of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. This was an unimaginable tragedy, and justice must be done for the victims, survivors, bereaved and the wider community. It is right that we learn everything we can about what happened and take the necessary steps to make sure that nothing like it ever happens again. Mr Speaker, yesterday also allowed the nation to come together one year on to remember all the victims of the Manchester terrorist attack. That night saw the worst of humanity, but it also saw the best. The kindness, compassion and fortitude we witnessed that night triumphed, and the great spirit of Manchester continues to inspire us. <laughs> Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Kerry McCarthy. I would echo the condolences expressed by the Prime Minister to the victims, friends and families of both Grenfell and the Manchester bombing. And on a happier note, congratulations from this side of the House to the royal couple. Um, I think even the fully paid up cynics amongst us found it quite charming. <laughs> and I'm very much one of them. <laughs> And a not so welcome American import, Mr. Speaker, is that Britain now has more children who are classed as obese at the age of 11 than does America. Wow. Yesterday's Public wow. Health England report showed the dismal failure of the first year targets on cutting sugar at only 2%. That's compared to 11% drop in the tax um, on sugary drinks. Will the Prime Minister admit that the voluntary approach is simply not working, it won't work, and that what we want to see in Chapter 2 of the Childhood Obesity Plan is mandatory targets and a ban on junk food discounts? Can I say to the uh, uh, Honourable Lady, first of all, I welcome her good wishes for the Royal Couple. We uh, expressed those here in this House last week, but indeed I think it was um, a perfect day and a perfect uh, uh, wedding, and, and Windsor, I think, did the couple proud as well. Now, we know that childhood obesity, the issue she raises, is one of the greatest challenges that we, health challenges that we're facing, and we are determined to tackle it. That's why uh, nowhere in the world is setting more stringent sugar reduction targets than the government has set. We are, as she says, taxing sugary drinks. We're also doing more. It's not just about sugar in food and drinks. It's about helping children to exercise more. It's also about uh, the funding we're putting into researching on junk food advertising uh, and cutting, obviously, sugar and calories in food. We have made good progress with the sugar reduction target. Sugar in drinks has been reduced by 11 per cent and the average calories per portion by 6 per cent in response to the soft drinks industry levy. But absolutely more does need to be done, which is why an updated plan is currently being worked up and we will be in a position to share more on that shortly. Nigel Huddleston. May I uh, associate myself with the Prime Minister's earlier comments? Um, indeed, this week we have seen the start of the Grenfell inquiry, and last week Dame Judith Hackett reported that our building regulations were not fit for purpose. Yet she did not specifically recommend a ban on inflammable cladding. Can the Prime Minister confirm that nevertheless it is her clear intention to ban inflammable cladding and ensure that another tragedy like Grenfell never happens again? Yeah. 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 Well, can I say to my honourable friend that I think the de deeply moving testimonies that we've already heard and will continue to hear from survivors and the bereaved this week leave absolutely no room for doubt. We must learn everything we can about what has happened, and we must take uh, the strongest possible action to stop such an unimaginable tragedy from ever happening again. As he says, uh, Dame Judith Hackett's recommendations did not include recommending the banning of uh, inflammable cladding. We are minded to go further. Uh, by banning combustible materials in cladding on high-rise buildings. We are meeting our legal duty to consult on these proposals, and we will not delay any necessary action. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Indeed, it is almost a year since the Grenfell tragedy, and uh, sadly, justice has not yet been done. Many of those families have still not been rehoused, and many are still living in tower blocks where they're worried around the country of the safety of the cladding. More needs to be done more quickly. 
I agree with what the Prime Minister said about the anniversary of the Manchester bomb. We were there at the service yesterday, and I pay tribute to the people of Manchester for the fantastic event they held last night in Albert Square, which brought all communities across Manchester together. That's the answer to terrorism. That's the answer to threats. Bring people together. Yeah. Mr Speaker, in 2010, in 2010, four billion pounds of NHS services were outsourced to private companies. How much is it today? Well, can I first of all say to the right honourable gentleman that I echo his comments. The terrorists uh, who attacked in Manchester, but also, sadly, we saw a number of other terrorist attacks in this country last year. They were trying to divide us. I think the response of all communities, be it here in London or in Manchester, has shown that we will not be divided by the terrorists. We will not let the terrorists win, and we will defeat them. Uh, can I say to the right honourable gentleman that he asks about the uh, outsourcing of uh, services within the National Health Service? Of course, what we do know is that the spend on the independent sector nearly doubled yeah. in the last four years yeah. of a Labour yeah. government. Yeah. Mr Speaker, my question was about the amount spent now. <laughs> NHS budgets have increased by just 1% per year yeah. under this government, but it's jackpot time for the privateers. Their share is up by 100% to over £9 billion per year. And we learnt that Surrey NHS has just paid Virgin Healthcare £1.5 million, not for any service they delivered, but because their bid wasn't chosen. £1.5 million wasted on Virgin Healthcare that should have been spent on healthcare itself. Is the Prime Minister concerned that this week the National Audit Office said NHS England's handling of private contractors had, and I quote, put patients at risk of serious harm. The uh, right honourable gentleman that on the National Audit Office report, what they said was no actual harm has been identified. It is also the case. It is also the case that, in relation to the particular uh, contracts they were talking about, the savings that have been made have all been reinvested in frontline NHS patient care, and has helped to fund the equivalent, the equivalent of an extra 30,000 operations. But he talks about the uh, percentage of money that has been spent on uh, the private sector. Uh, I have to say, last year, the proportion of spend in the NHS in England outsourced to private sector did not go up at all. There was somewhere where it went up 0.8 per cent. Oh, yes, Wales. Mr Speaker, the... Mr Speaker, the National Audit Office criticised NHS England's capita contract, saying, and I quote, it had put patients at risk of serious harm. Thousands of women dropped from the national cervical cancer screening programmes. Another element of the contract handed over to capita was for GP services which resulted in two-thirds of GP practices receiving incorrect medical records. 500,000 new patient letters left unsent. Isn't this the inevitable consequence of this government tearing up the founding principles of the NHS and putting, and putting private profit before public service? to the right honourable gentleman. At every general election since the NHS was formed, the Labour Party has scaremongered about the Conservative approach to the NHS. They have made, at every general election, they have made claims about privatisation, they have made claims about funding cuts. And what has every elected Conservative government done? We have protected the NHS. the NHS. We have improved the NHS services, we have put more funding into the NHS and we have ensured that we remain true to the founding principle of the NHS, that it is free at the point of delivery. From the party that opposed the NHS in the first place, that is a bit rich. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker. Order, 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 order. Far too much noise on both sides of the House. I've got plenty of time, and I'm sure the principals have as well, and we will get through the questions, but preferably in an atmosphere of calm. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the Royal College of GPs says, and I quote, the long list of failures made by Capita have been incredibly frustrating for GPs and our teams. We are still dealing with the fallout. It is public servants bearing the brunt of private failure. Mr Speaker, GPs are leaving the profession in despair. 4,000 have retired early in the past five years. That is one in ten. In 2015, the Health Secretary said he would hire another 5,000 GPs. Yeah, where are they? How many more GPs are there than there were in 2015? Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, we now have over 14,900 more doctors in our NHS than in 2010. And we are indeed committed to delivering 5,000 more GPs, and we've increased the number of, uh, of training uh, of, uh, for GPs. But can I also say to the right honourable gentleman, he talks about this issue of the private sector being used in the National Health Service. Well, he might actually ask the Shadow Health Secretary what his view is on this, because the Shadow Health Secretary has said. We are still going to buy from the private sector where we haven't got capacity in the NHS. His shadow health sector is committed to it. Mr Speaker, the shadow health secretary has a very good understanding of the needs of patients and would always put them first. And he will, he will not be the one who is putting the private sector first. Mr Speaker, the reality is there are a thousand fewer GPs and the number is falling. No wonder that more and more people are writing to me every week saying how difficult it is to get a GP appointment. GPs are the bedrock of the NHS. We need more of them. Mr Speaker, I had a letter this week from Anne. Yes, Anne, she is somebody who is retired and until recently had been caring for her mother at home and she wrote the NHS pay a private nursing home for mum's care day after day we experience a catalogue of disasters I can't leave my mum knowing that her needs aren't catered for so I spend hours at the nursing home what action is the government taking to deal with the substandard care providers give in the private care sector, which is so upsetting for so many people? Yeah. 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 To the right honourable gentleman, and to Anne, that I fully understand that people want to ensure and want to have the confidence and the reassurance of knowing that the care that their loved ones is receiving is of a good quality. That is why it is this government, that is why it is this government that's put in place the various steps to ensure that we are looking into the quality of care that is provided uh, that is provided in those uh, in those sectors. But he talks about uh, the Shadow Health Secretary recognising the needs of patients. I think he was saying he recognised the needs of patients and that's why the private sector would be used in some cases. But can I just can I just also say to him that the former health minister, now the Mayor for Manchester, said the private sector puts its capacity into the NHS for the benefit of NHS patients, which I think most people in this country would celebrate. Jeremy Corbyn. The Shadow Health Secretary is dedicated to the NHS, not to handing it over to private contractors. That's the difference. Mr Speaker, the care... Mr Speaker, the Care Quality Commission said last year there is too much poor care. A fifth of care providers require improvement. Year after year, private sector care providers are letting down our elderly. This year, Mr Speaker, is the 70th birthday of the National Health Service. I pay tribute to all its staff over all of those 70 years. But the NHS reaches this milestone with the worst A&E waits on record, yeah. the worst delays for cancer referrals on record, yeah. falling numbers of GPs, 
falling numbers of nurses and the longest funding squeeze in its history. While this government opens the door to even more profiteering, why doesn't the Prime Minister act now? now to end the siphoning off of billions of pounds from patient care and give it to the NHS the funding that it needs. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, we do indeed pay tribute to all those who have worked in the National Health Service over its 70 years and who work, and who work there today. And we want to see a bright future for the NHS, which is why we will be coming forward with a long-term plan for the National Health Service. And what we see today is a National Health Service with more funding going into it, but crucially, crucially with more people being treated, more operations being undertaken. There are people alive today who have suffered from cancer who would not have been alive just eight years ago because our cancer outcomes have improved. That's the reality of our National Health Service. But what we also see What we also see is that this government can only put money into the National Health Service because we have a balanced approach to our economy. What do we and what did we learn this week that the Labour Party and the Shadow Chancellor want to do? They want to overthrow capitalism. What would that mean? It would mean families paying higher taxes. Oh well it's supported on parts of the Labour Party. Now we know where the Labour Party really stand on this issue. But But I say to the Shadow Chancellor and others, what would this mean? It would be families paying higher taxes, more debt for our children in future, fewer people in jobs, and less money for our schools and hospitals. A Labour Party that would bankrupt our economy would do unlasting damage to our National Health Service. Mr Speaker, the government has stated its ambition for the UK to have 10% of the worldwide space industry by the year 2030. Central to achieving this is uh, establishing our own launch capabilities within the UK through uh, UK spaceports. Cornwall is keen and ready to play a significant part in this. So can my right honourable friend confirm that the government is committed to the establishment of UK spaceports and will she ensure the right people get together to deliver this in Cornwall as soon as possible? Well, can, I, can I say to uh, my honourable friend that he makes a, uh, he's putting a good bid and is a good champion for Cornwall in this particular issue? He's absolutely right. Our industrial strategy does identify the role of new markets like space launch in driving growth across the United Kingdom, and that's why we're delivering a programme to ensure that small satellite uh, companies can offer small satellite launch and suborbital orbital space flight from UK spaceports. Um, in relation to the specific issue on Newquay and Cornwall, uh, there is a strong enthusiasm for this new opportunity shown by Newquay Airport and other locations around the UK. And of course, that is why in March the Government brought forward the Space Industry Act to support them, and we have made £50 million available to enable those small satellite launch and suborbital flight from UK space ports. And the Space Agency is considering funding to help kickstart promising projects, and will be making announcements shortly. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister, both on Manchester and, of course, on Grenfell? Mr Speaker, the Windrush scandal has taught us that the UK Government's hostile environment policy has targeted those who legally live here. Young people who have grown up in the UK and know of nothing else face losing their lawful settled status because they simply cannot afford the paperwork. Home office fees have increased by 148 per cent since 2014. These children have the right to be here. The UK is their home. I am giving the Prime Minister today the opportunity. Will she scrap these fees for young people 
as she has done for the Windrush generation. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman that a minor who has indefinite leave to remain will have access to benefits and entitlements which put them on an equal footing to their British citizen peers. So a grant of British citizenship is not therefore required. Now, of course, specific exemptions from application fees are provided to several groups with limited means, such as stateless people, victims of modern slavery or domestic abuse, asylum applicants, children who are looked after by a local authority. And the Children's Act 1989 imposes a general duty on local authorities to promote the upbringing of children in need by providing a range and level of services appropriate to those children's needs, regardless of their status. In Blackford. Mr Speaker, that simply is not good enough. We're talking about up to 120,000 young people in this country. We're talking about young people who live here, who have to wait 10 years and pay up to £10,000 to achieve permanent rights to remain. It is shocking. This government is guilty of creating a generation of undocumented citizens without the rights that many of us take for granted. Will the Prime Minister change her policies which target young people, and will she meet with me and the Honourable Member for Cumbernauld to resolve this issue? The right honourable gentleman. First of all, he quotes a figure which I certainly don't recognise in terms of the cost that he suggests for uh, for an application for an application for citizenship here in the United Kingdom. But I repeat the point that I have made: that the minor who has indefinite leave to remain will have access to the benefits and entitlements which put them on an equal footing to their British citizen peers. So a grant of British citizenship is not required in order to be able to have access to those rights and benefits. Tom Perscott. Love. Yeah, 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 yeah. Through regular exercise, daily mile initiatives help to make sure that children in schools are physically active, um, have better mental health and a best place to learn and achieve. And I know that my right honourable friend recognises the value of prevention in helping to address some of the health challenges that we face as a nation. So will she join me in calling for schools across the country to roll out the Daily Mile? What can I say to my honourable friend that uh, the Daily Mile is an excellent programme. It's uh, simple and inclusive and it can, as he says, successfully engage children in physical activity who otherwise would not be undertaking that physical activity. This gives me an opportunity, though, to congratulate him on running the London Marathon for two... Two of his local charities, Corby, Nightlights and Crazy Hats Breast Cancer Appeal. And well done to my honourable friend for doing that. But I certainly agree with him. We want to see more schools adopting the active approach and adopting the Daily Mile. Pete Wishart. Yeah. Mr Speaker, as the nation's attention was rightly focused on the Royal Wedding, the Prime Minister was busy stuffing the House of Lords with 30 new members. After all these defeats, apparently... Order! 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 The Honourable Gentleman's question must be heard. Pete Wishart. And it will be, Mr Speaker. It's his question, and he's got a right to ask his question, and he will ask his question. The question will be heard, and the answer will be heard. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it will continue. Pete Wishart. And I'm grateful to you, Mr Speaker, and it will be heard, because after all these defeats, apparently we need the right type of crony. There are now over 800 cronies, donors and aristocrats in that circus down the corridor, embarrassing this nation and mocking any notion of democracy. How many more is she going to be going to appoint? And when will enough be enough? Well, can I say to the uh, to the right honourable gentleman that actually the size of the total size of the House of Lords has fallen since I took office in July 2000. Uh, in July 2016, and uh, uh, from the sound of what he says, I think he's making a bid for himself to be put in the House of Lords. He needs to speak to his leader. (laughs) Mr John Whittingdale. As my right honourable friend is aware, at the end of last year, my constituent, Natalie Lewis Hoyle, the daughter of Councillor Miriam Lewis and our right honourable friend, the member for Chorley, took her own life, having been in a coercive Uh, relationship and suffered mental abuse in what is known as gaslighting. Does my right friend agree that we need to raise awareness of this particular kind of abuse? And will she support Miriam Lewis in establishing the Chat with Nat website in memory of Natalie to help and advise those affected 
by this behaviour. Yeah. Can, I, can I thank my right hon. Friend for raising what is a very important issue and start by saying I am sure members of, on all sides of this House will join me in offering our deepest sympathies and condolences to Councillor Miriam Lewis and the right hon. Member for Chorley. And I would like to thank my right hon. Friend for bringing this website uh, in memory of Natalie to my attention. I am happy to offer my full support to this project. I'm sure that it is going to provide much-needed help and advice to those who are in the most difficult and painful of circumstances. We have, of course, changed the law to introduce a new domestic abuse offence of coercion and control uh, in intimate and familial relationships. And since the introduction of the, the offence, there have been almost 300 successful prosecutions. I think this shows what a problem this issue is out there. But we are always looking for what more can be done, and we are currently looking in our consultation on transforming the, abuse on, uh, the uh, law on domestic abuse and violence to uh, we're looking for ideas on how the offence can be further strengthened to ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice. Yeah. Mary Glendon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In North Tyneside and across the UK, home buyers are being sold new houses that have serious defects by developers such as Bellway and Persimmon, but there is no means of sufficient redress. Following the recent government consultation, will the Prime Minister put her weight behind establishing a new homes ombudsman to give these consumers the proper redress they urgently need? Yes. Can I, can I say to the Honourable Lady that, of course, we want to ensure, as we are building more homes and we need to build more homes for people, and we want to ensure that those homes are fit for, for the purpose. There are standards that house builders have to, uh, have to abide by. And uh, I say to the Honourable Lady there are a number of ways in which it is possible to raise these issues where there are defects in house, homes that are being built. Julian Sturdy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Bowel cancer claims the lives of over 44 people every day and has a devastating impact on families up and down the country. But it can be beaten, if caught at the earliest stage, through better diagnosis. So can the Prime Minister therefore assure me that the Government will listen to proposals to lower the screening age from 60 to 50? Can I say to uh, my hon. Friend that we now have the highest cancer survival rates ever. As I indicated earlier, latest figures show that an estimated 7,000 or more people are surviving cancer after successful NHS cancer treatment compared to three years ago. But there is still more to be done, and he's absolutely right that early diagnosis is an important element of that. What we are doing is looking at how the development of smart technologies, which allow us to analyse great quantities of data quickly and with a higher degree of accuracy than through a human being, the intervention of human beings, um, can be used to ensure that we get that earlier diagnosis. And we want to see by 2030, uh, 2033 at least 50,000 people each year being diagnosed at an early stage of prostate. Uh, 50,000 more people being diagnosed at an early stage of prostate, ovarian, lung, or bowel cancer. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Despite a groundswell of opposition from public, staff and clinicians, this Government is actively supporting the removal of vital services from South Tyneside Hospital. Can the Prime Minister tell the 149,000 people who rely on our hospital why? Can I say that, as I think the Honourable Lady will know, it is for the local NHS to make decisions about the future of local health services. These matters are not determined in Whitehall, but the Sunderland, I understand Sunderland and South Tyneside Hospital Trusts have formed an alliance to improve the sustainability, quality and performance of hospital services. Local commissioners did consult with the public and they have agreed a number of service changes in February which will improve services for patients. Dr Andrew Murison. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. In the 1940s, access by British epidemiologists to patient data established the causal relationship between smoking and lung cancer. How will the big data and artificial intelligence the Prime Minister spoke about on Monday help us transform healthcare outcomes today? And what barriers to data sharing exist in the way? 
Well, can I say to my honourable friend that, uh, as he says, on Monday I did announce that we will use data, artificial intelligence and innovation to transform the prevention, early diagnosis and treatment of chronic diseases by 2030. I have just referenced, uh, in response to uh, uh, my honourable friend, the fact that we will want to see at least 50,000 people each year being diagnosed at an early stage of prostate, ovarian, lung or bowel cancer. What that will mean is that every year around 22,000 fewer people will die within five years of their diagnosis compared to today. And, but we are also committed to the highest possible standards in using data, and that is why we uh, brought forward the Data Protection Bill and have announced our intention to create a new centre for data ethics and innovation. Big data gives huge opportunities for us to improve services to patients in the NHS, but of course we must use that data very carefully, and patients need to have the confidence that it is being used carefully, and that is what we will do. Paul Blomfield. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister uh, for agreeing to meet with Sheffield Young Carers this afternoon? They are very much looking forward to sharing their views with her, and I am sure she is going to enjoy the meeting. But can I raise another issue? Last week, the Education Secretary told the House that he understood the cost pressures facing schools and he would work with them to bear down on those costs. On Friday, I met with a group of Sheffield primary and secondary head teachers who said their schools were at a tipping point. And they said that if the government wanted to help them bear down on costs, they could start by fully funding the teachers' pay increase, yeah. Yeah. the increase in national insurance and pension contributions. Yeah. Yeah. Will she do that? Yeah. Yeah. I say to the honourable gentleman, I'm looking forward to meeting him with the uh, with the young carers, and I'm sure that's going to be a, a really um, interesting meeting. And it's imp- I'm pleased that they'll have the opportunity to hear directly from them. Um, as he will know, in relation to school funding, the new national funding formula is providing for a cash increase for every school in every region and protected funding for those with additional needs. But it is important that the Department for Education is helping to bear down on costs that uh, that schools are. Expecting. Experiencing, and that's exactly what uh, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Education, is doing, ensuring that the Department is giving support to schools where it's needed. Pause. Thank you, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. The, the UK motor industry has undergone a resurgence. It employs 900,000 people, generates one tenth of all manufacturing output, and exports 80% of the vehicles it produces. As we leave the EU, will the Prime Minister ensure the sector will continue to have access to the work as it needs to bring in components without delays and sell into its biggest market, export market tariff-free? Well, my, my honourable friend indeed draws attention to what is a very important sector here in our economy. The motor industry does play a very significant role in our economy. And, uh, Our exit from the EU provides us with an opportunity to forge a new role for ourselves, to become that great global trading nation, to have those other trade deals around the uh, world. But we also need to ensure we can provide as much certainty as we can at an early stage. And that's why we're working with businesses and other stakeholders, including the motor industry, and looking for as free and frictionless trade between the UK and the EU as possible, because we want to see that trade flowing freely, those integrated supply chains being able to work as well as possible. Possible, and that's what we're working for in our future partnership. J. Platt. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, in my constituency of Lee, NHS workers are mm. currently on strike. I'm sure the Prime Minister would like to wish them well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is due to the move of more than 800 staff to, into a wholly owned subsidiary, a direct result of NHS underfunding. Yeah. Yeah. In the wake of Carillion, why is the Prime Minister allowing backdoor privatisation, yeah. Yeah. which has little or no public support, instead of keeping the NHS where it should be, safely in public hands? Yeah. I think I answered comments about the uh, National Health Service in response to the Leader of the Opposition. I will just reiterate, this government, this government is committed. We are putting extra funding into our National Health Service. We are committed to a long-term plan for our National Health Service that will give it certainty and sustainability over a longer period of time than through the agile, uh, annual budget-making process. And we are committed to a National Health Service that remains free at the point of delivery. Priti Patel. Yeah. 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 Y
know that stem cell transplants can be the only lifeline for leukaemia patients. And tragically, children like five-year-old Kaya and 11-year-old Raji, whose families are in Parliament today for a donor awareness event, have only a 21% chance of finding a donor match because there are simply not enough donors registered from an Asian background. Now, childhood leukaemia affects children of eth every ethnic group. Will the Prime Minister commit to leading a nationwide donor registration drive to help to save the lives of hundreds of children suffering from leukaemia like Kaya and Ranjit? Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I thank my right honourable friend for raising this issue and for highlighting it with the uh, uh, experience of children like Kaya and Raji? And uh, she is doing, I know, a lot of work to raise awareness of the lack of donors from Asian backgrounds, and particularly for her event in today in Parliament. And we support efforts to raise awareness of the need to recruit more stem cell donors from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. And uh, more than £20 million has been provided to NHS Blood and Transplant and Anthony Nolan for stem cell donations since 2015. And that includes some very specific stipulations about the numbers of newly registered donors stored in the UK Cord Blood Bank that must be from BAME backgrounds and specific funding to support the recruitment of donors from BAME backgrounds. Of course more needs to be done. I'm happy to voice my support for her event, which I think is continuing to raise the awareness of this important issue. Mr. Madders. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure the Prime Minister, like millions of other people, was glued to her TV set on Saturday watching an event of national importance. Sadly, there was not a fairy tale ending as Chelsea won the FA Cup. <laughs> But that could be the last FA Cup final played at Wembley before it is sold to an overseas owner. Wow. Now, when Premier League clubs spend hundreds of millions of pounds every year on wages and transfers, does the Prime Minister agree with me? There's actually more than enough money in the game for there to be no need to sell off this iconic national asset. Yeah. Can I say to the honourable gentleman, uh, that is a decision for the owners of Wembley. It is a private matter. It is not a matter for the government. Jeremy Lefroy. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Just over five years ago, just over five years ago, the Francis report was published at the instigation of uh, my honourable friend for Stone. And since then, there have been major improvements in patient safety throughout the NHS. But just in relation to County Hospital in Stafford, would my right honourable friend congratulate the staff there who have seen? A great improvement over the years with the result that in A&E now we're seeing more patients over 14 hours, I wish it was 24 hours, than we did in 24 hours a day, and they're meeting the 95 plus percent target on a weekly basis. Yeah. Can I say to my honourable friend that the Francis report was a very important report. It highlighted uh, an area of deep concern about what had been happening in uh, the uh, local hospital. Uh, can I welcome uh, what he has said about County Hospital and the work that is being done there and the excellent work that they are doing to provide for patients, to provide safely for patients, to provide more treatments for patients and to uh, provide those services to his constituents and others. Yes, Mr. Brock. Yes. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has two groups of ministers trying different scenarios for a frictionless border with Ireland. We know the backstop alignment can only be ended if another solution is found. Isn't it the truth she doesn't have a clue how it might work? No. Mr. Philip Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I, uh, can I paraphrase our former colleague, the late great uh, Eric Forth? Uh, Prime Minister, I believe in the free market. I believe in individual freedom, individual responsibility, and I'm suspicious of the nanny state. Am I still a Conservative? <laughs> Thank you. Sir Vincent Cable. The, uh, the uh, Prime Minister and the Leader of the Labour Opposition. Oh, order. Uh, I, let's hear the full eloquence of his flow and the flow of his eloquence. Sir Vincent Cable. The Prime Minister and the Leader of the Labour Opposition both agree that we should leave the single market, leave the European Union, Customs Union, and that the public should not have a final say on the Brexit deal. So, um, would she dispense with our tradition of party political point scoring and publicly. <laughs> and, uh, and 
And in that spirit which I am setting, would she publicly thank the leadership of the Labour Party for their help and support in making Brexit happen? Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, first of all, I am not so sure about the position of the Labour Party because they are talking about a second referendum. But secondly, can I I just say to him, there is nobody who knows more about party political point scoring in this House than the Liberal Democrats. Mr Peter Bone! Mr Speaker, thank you for calling me at 12.43. Your stewardship of allowing backbenchers to get in to question the Prime Minister is much appreciated. Prime Minister, how are the European Union negotiations going? How are the European Union negotiations going? They're going with uh, purpose and good intent and goodwill on both sides. And uh, we have negotiators over in Brussels this week doing further work on those negotiations. And we are determined to deliver a good Brexit for the United Kingdom. Luciana Berger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mental health is now the number one public health concern for a third of our country. Its importance has jumped 16 percentage points in the past year alone. And yet, the Joint Health and Education Select Committee's report, published last week, said that the government's strategy for young people's mental health lacked any ambition and will fail a generation. Will the Prime Minister commit to think again and go back to the drawing boards to ensure that we afford every young person in the, our country the best start in life? Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that by 2020 21, we have committed to ensuring 70,000 more children and young people will have access to high quality NHS mental health care? We recognise the importance of mental health among young people because I think it's something like half of mental health problems later in life have started before the age of 14. That's why one of the initiatives the Government has taken is to ensure that staff in schools will be trained to better identify mental health problems and better able to ensure that those young people with those mental health problems get the treatment and get the support that they need. But I I will just say one final thing. I think it is important that mental health, as she says, has, has been rising up the scale of people's concerns. I think I would like to think that, that is partly because we have ensured that there is greater awareness of the issue of mental health and everybody in this House has a job to ensure that we remove the stigma attached to mental health so people do feel able to come forward when they have mental health problems. Luke Graham. Much, Mr. Speaker. Does my right honourable friend share the surprise that I had as a former MS employee at the news that the SNP administration had bullied Marks and Spencer over the use of the word British and the union flag on British produce? Will she stand with me against this petty bullying? and support companies that are proud of Scottish and British produce. Can I absolutely agree with my honourable friend? We should all be proud of Scottish and British produce, of produce for any part of our United Kingdom. And uh, and I think it is frankly appalling that the Scottish Government did not want to see the Union flag and the word British on uh, on produce. And uh, it's not only appalling, it failed to reflect the vote that took place in Scotland, which showed that people in Scotland want to stay part of the United Kingdom. Tracy Brabin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mid-Yorkshire NHS Hospital Trust is struggling to recruit doctors because of immigration rules. One example is an experienced paediatric doctor who has applied for a visa every month for six months and now has given up because he has been rejected six times. What can the Prime Minister say to my constituents to reassure them that the Home Office delays won't impact on the safety and health of their loved ones yeah. at this time of greatest need? Yeah. Yeah. I say to the Honourable Lady that we do keep this issue of the uh, Tier 2 visas uh, under review in relation to the health services. We have already taken steps. We took steps a while back to ensure that the uh, numbers could be adjusted to reflect the need for nurses, and we continue to look at the situation in relation to doctors. Thank you. Order. 